Hello, and welcome to today's webinar. I would like to introduce to you our speaker, Dr. Julie Horton. Before joining the Burdock Group, Dr. Horton had over seven years of experience in preclinical metabolic research and genetic engineering. Her credentials include two bachelor's degrees, one in microbiology and molecular biology, and another in biotechnology. She also has a master's degree in biomedical sciences from the University of Central Florida. Dr. Horton also earned a doctorate for her research on short-chain carbon metabolism, which was conducted at the Sanford Burnham Center for Metabolic Origins of Disease, and resulted in seven publications that have received over 300 citations to date. Dr. Horton joined us here at the Burdock Group in early 2018 and works with clients to establish firm scientific basis for achieving regulatory compliance for a variety of companies using innovative technology to make ingredients. Without further ado, I will now turn it over to Dr. Julie Horton. Thank you so much for that kind introduction, Tatiani. Today, I will be discussing some of the current technology driving innovation in the plant-based protein space. I will also be discussing some of the regulatory considerations that accompany such technology. First though, I would like to briefly tell those who are not familiar with Burdock Group a little bit about who we are and what we do. Essentially, we are an interdisciplinary team of scientists and regulatory experts that help our clients find solutions to complex compliance issues. We primarily focus on food ingredients for humans and animals, including pets and dietary supplements. But we work with other consumer goods as well, like cosmetics and pesticides. Our two core values at Burdock Group are a commitment to quality and confidentiality. Many consultants work virtually as independent contractors, and it's difficult to hold them accountable. But all of us are here in Orlando as full-time employees that work in a brick and mortar office. Our consulting team is supported by strong organizational infrastructure and project management. We even have an extensive in-house library. As with any successful service business, the key to our success is ultimately the people that work here. From our founder, Dr. George Burdock, who was a pioneer in the flavor industry, to our newest team member, Brian Parente, who holds a master's degree in nanotechnology and brings practical phytochemistry experience to our team, we pride ourselves on having a breadth of expertise to tackle even the most complex regulatory obstacles. As you can imagine, much of our work deals with novel food ingredients. Having a bird's eye view on the industry, we often recognize developing trends, and this includes the topic of our webinar today, plant-based proteins. As you all are likely aware, plant-based protein has become quite popular in recent years. Personally, I think that I have seen a tremendous increase in plant-based food claims on products that I see on my supermarket shelf. This isn't just a qualitative observation though that I may have made because I have a bias as an insider in the food industry. In fact, the Institute of Food Technology or IFT as it's more commonly known, published an article in October of this year that was pretty interesting. In the IFT article, they report that there is a 68% average annual growth in food and beverage launches with a plant-based claim during the past five years. The increase in claims is also accompanied by an increase in sales. In 2019, U.S. retail sales of plant-based foods grew 11.4%. Then, of course, 2020 came and it hit everybody like a sack of bricks. Much of the world has been turned upside down, but the market for plant-based foods has continued its upward momentum. In fact, after the peak panic buying settled down in late March this year, you know, when we were all trying to find toilet paper, the following four weeks saw a 27% increase in sales of plant-based foods from the same time last year. This increase was 35% higher than the rate of growth for total retail food. Even a pandemic can't stop the plant-based food revolution. So if I was a betting person, I would say this is going to be a large segment of the food market for years to come. 
and much of this growth in the plant-based food space is due to innovation in the plant-based protein category. Plant-based proteins are sometimes meant to mimic meat or dairy, but increasingly they are being used to impart their own unique characteristics in food. Consumers are not only looking for meat substitutes, but they are also looking for new and exciting foods that have the added benefit of being healthy. The diversity in this space continues to grow. Innovators, though, must overcome specific regulatory hurdles to market their food in the U.S. So now I want to talk a little bit in generalities about compliance strategies that are used for food ingredients. Under sections 201S and 409 of the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, any substance that is intentionally added to food is a food additive. Food additives are subject to pre-market review and approval by FDA through the food additive petition process, unless a substance is generally recognized among qualified experts as having been adequately shown to be safe under the conditions of its intended use. This path is known as generally recognized as safe or GRASS. The basis for both a food additive petition or an FAP and a GRASS determination is the safety profile of the ingredient when used as intended. Submission of an FAP, if successful, results in a federally recognized approval of a food ingredient. An approved FAP is codified in the CFR. However, an FAP is typically more data intensive than a GRASS and because it requires the explicit approval of the FDA, it takes a much longer time to complete. The FAP must include the proposed ingredient common name in addition to the scientific name and cast number. It must also include a detailed description and specification of the ingredient, specific purpose of the ingredient, manufacturing details, limitations of use, toxicity data, and residue analysis for ingestible tissues. An environmental assessment is also required. The FDA determines if the ingredient is safe for the intended use based on the submission. Then a proposed rule is announced in the Federal Register. There's a comment period, and eventually you get to a final rule. The FDA claims that the overall process takes an average of three to five years, but in actuality, the average is five to eight years. And for some ingredients, you can see that the approval of the food additive took over a decade. We typically recommend pursuing generally recognized as safe for new food ingredients due to the time it takes to get a food additive approved. There are some cases though, where an FAP is really necessary. A grass ingredient is exempt from the food additive status when used as intended and completion of a grass assessment is an alternative route for achieving regulatory compliance. There are two bases that grass can be determined. In rare cases, if an ingredient has a documented history of use before 1958, experts can review that documentation and decide if the evidence is sufficient for the ingredient to be considered safe. This is one path to generally recognize as safe, but most ingredients that were used before 1958 and were safe have already been evaluated and are determined as grass. The more common way for novel food ingredients of achieving grass is through scientific procedures. To build a grass dossier based on scientific procedures, you need to describe the intended use of the ingredient, the identity and specifications of the ingredient, method of manufacturing, and conduct a comprehensive review of safety and utility studies that have been evaluated by experts in the field. In the case of truly novel ingredients, published studies are often not available. And in this case, you will likely need to conduct some testing to support the narrative of safety. In order to achieve the general recognition of safety, you typically need to publish the results of these safety studies 
in a peer-reviewed journal. The final dossier is then reviewed by independent experts qualified in training and experience. Once a substance has been determined grass, it technically may be sold in the U.S. with or without a grass notification submitted to the FDA. The time it takes to complete a determination of grass largely depends on whether or not you will need to conduct your own studies. If there are no studies needed, dossiers can be constructed in four to six months. If talk studies are needed though, this process can take one to two years. Now that we have a baseline understanding of how food ingredients are regulated in the U.S., let's look at some of the unique challenges that plant-based protein ingredients may face. There are two factors in the ingredient development process that are driving most of the current innovation. First, human ingenuity has allowed for a plethora of new and creative approaches to sourcing plant protein. Secondly, processing technologies have been developed to allow for plant protein to be added to foods with desirable textures and consistency. Protein is found in all life forms and plants are no exception. All plants have protein and at least 14% of the total calories of every plant are protein. There are tons of creative ways that R&D departments are harnessing the protein in plants. Some of the more popular methods of sourcing plant-based proteins are through upcycling, using production and microbes, also called production organisms, selective breeding, and directly genetically engineering the plants. First, I'm going to talk a bit about upcycling. Upcycling involves creating a value-added product of what was previously considered waste. I am personally a big fan of upcycling. In fact, I often upcycle accidentally. Here's a picture of my dog, Bella, repurposing one of my son's toys as a dog chew. Many in the food industry, though, are intentionally upcycling in new ways. Upcycled food is not only good for sustainability, but it is also providing an additional source of revenue. For example, rapeseed is the third largest source of vegetable oil in the world. Protein-rich byproducts from oil production, such as rapeseed cake or meal, have been predominantly used as animal feed. However, new research published in the journal Nutrients found rapeseed protein has a similar metabolic profile in humans as soy protein. These results suggest that rapeseed byproducts could be a source of plant protein in the human diet, and essentially the rapeseed farmers have figured out what the sausage makers have known for quite some time. So if you're considering developing a plant-based protein food ingredient from upcycling, there are a few key considerations to keep in mind that will help you navigate the regulatory process. As we discussed, the basis for both a food additive petition and a grass determination is the safety profile. Many factors affect safety. For upcycled foods, you want to establish why this byproduct was considered waste. Was it considered waste because of quality issues or because it's not safe to eat? A quality issue, for example, could be bruising, or it could be an unappealing taste profile. The safety issue, though, may be that there is a toxic chemical present in the byproduct. Figuring out whether a waste product would have a safety concern is not always as straightforward as it seems. For example, there are fruits and vegetables that have toxic metabolites when they are unripe. The chemical profile of a plant changes throughout its life. And just because a ripe version of the plant is edible doesn't necessarily mean that an unripe or overripe plant would be equally benign. Another consideration for upcycled foods is how the processing will affect the safety profile. Residues from solvents used in an extraction process could be concerning and would need to be addressed in any FAP or grass dossier. Some of the chemical constituents in the plant may be more concentrated after processing. Your processing could be designed to concentrate the plant protein, but it also may concentrate chemicals in the plant 
that at higher doses cause toxicity. The dose makes a poison is the most basic adage of toxicology, and the dose of any substance is cr a critical element in its safety profile. It is critical that the intended use of the final product be analyzed to establish an estimated daily intake, or EDI. In our firm, we have a proprietary software program that uses data from USDA dietary intake surveys and predicts the EDI of an ingredient based on its intended use. The EDIs are then compared to an acceptable daily intake, or ADI. An ADI can be established from published scientific literature or appropriate toxicological studies. Those are the primary concerns with upcycling. However, there are many, many, many variables that could affect what you need to do to gain approval, approval of your novel ingredient. The next source of plant-based protein that I'm going to talk about may not be readily apparent and is certainly probably not what most lay people think of when they hear plant-based protein. This source of plant-based protein is produced from microbial cell factories. Some strains of bacteria, yeast, fungi, and algae can be engineered to produce a protein that was originally found in a plant. So how exactly do production organisms work? This is oversimplified, but it's important to understand these basic principles of how cell factories work to understand downstream safety concerns. Essentially, the development process involves first identifying the genetic sequence of a plant protein of interest. You may find a protein that naturally occurs in a carrot, for example. For illustrative purposes, I'm gonna call this protein X. There is a genetic sequence in the carrot that tells the machinery of the carrot, the molecular machinery of the carrot, exactly how to build protein X. You can find out what this sequence is by doing your own sequencing, or very often this information is publicly available. Once you've identified the sequence, you can use a variety of molecular biology techniques to insert that genetic sequence into your microbial production organism. The microbial production organism is provided nutrients that allow for it to grow and then produce protein X. Once the production organism has sufficiently grown, you can then isolate protein X. There are different levels of protein purification. A protein can be completely isolated or purified. It can be partially purified, or even it can be maintained in the whole biomass. By the way, that's my handiwork from grad school. I've always been a fan of zip ties. As with all other food ingredients, the basis of regulatory approval for ingredients produced in genetically modified microbes is largely safety. The United States doesn't have any federal legislation that's specific to GMOs. There are guidelines and rules that agencies have developed, but GMOs and the substances acquired from GMOs are regulated in the same way that governs conventional products. For ingredients produced from microorganisms, the strain of the organism is taken into consideration for evaluating the safety. The amount of evidence required to demonstrate safety of the production organism depends in large part on how much of the production organism is removed during the purification of the final product. So if you have purely isolated protein X from the biomass, providing evidence of this can be a key element in crafting a narrative of safety. Often though, Protein purification is costly, difficult, and resource intensive. So most commercial enterprises do not have completely purified proteins. In cases like this, where the production organism ends up in the final product, you will need to demonstrate that the microbe is non-pathogenic. Kill steps incorporated into a manufacturing process can be helpful towards demonstrating that no viable cells remain in the final product. If the organism is a spore former, 
then the formation of spores will be a key consideration as they may survive kill steps in production. The proteomic profile of the final product must be shown not to contain any harmful toxins or allergens. It may seem simple to characterize the proteome of the production organism, but the proteome changes in response to environmental factors. So even if someone had a grass notification that received a no objection letter for the same species of E. coli that you're using, or same strain of E. coli that you're using, you still need to evaluate your specific product. You could have introduced a stressor that caused a toxic metabolite to be produced in the E. coli, for example. Very often toxins are metabolites created to protect an organism. So stress can be a key factor in whether a toxic metabolite is made or not. The FDA currently holds the position that any DNA that is introduced should have a well-characterized sequence and donor. I expect this will evolve a bit as synthetic biology becomes more mainstream, but for now, that's the FDA's position. The FDA is also pretty firm that antibiotic resistance markers should not be in the genome or any plasmids or chloroplasts of the production organism. This is more of a clear cut prohibition and it's doubtful that antibiotic resistance genes will ever be looked upon kindly. In addition to considering the safety profile of your plant-based protein and the microbial production organism, you will also need to think about what the composition of the media is and how much residual media remains in your final product. In the absence of testing your final product, standard toxicology rodent testing, like a 90 day subchronic study, you will need to extensively characterize any residual media and the amounts in the final product. The levels of each chemical in the final product should be evaluated to determine if it would present any safety concerns. Finally, I want to talk a bit about genetic modification. This can be a direct source of making plant-based protein. This is different than using a production organism that is genetically engineered. Instead of making the plant-based protein in a microbial production organism, you're modifying the genetics of the actual plant. Genetic modification can either be accomplished using selective breeding techniques or biotechnology. Let's look at how plant protein can be sourced from selective breeding. One example is direct selection for plants that contain higher levels of protein. Let's say you have a crop of carrots and you measure the protein in them. You find that carrot A has 10% protein, but carrot B has 15% protein. You would then select carrot B, the one with 15% protein, to breed and make more carrots. The resulting plant progeny would have a higher level of protein. Another selective breeding strategy is to select against undesirable traits. Many plants are non-toxic, but they also taste horrible. Some creative companies are identifying the chemicals that are causing an unpleasant taste and select against the plants that have higher levels of those chemicals. Selective breeding though, can be quite time consuming and much of the success depends on cooperation from the environment. So some plant-based protein is being sourced from plants that are genetically engineered. Genetic engineering of a plant can result in increasing desirable protein production or decreasing protein degradation. It can also help eliminate toxic metabolites that are present in the plant. One of the most fascinating examples of genetic engineering making an inedible product edible is what has happened with cottonseed recently. Cottonseed is high in protein and there's a lot of cotton in the world. However, cottonseed contains a toxic chemical called gossypol. In 1959, it was discovered that Hopi cotton didn't contain gossypol. However, 
efforts by the USDA and others to cultivate this strain on a large scale were unsuccessful. The plants ultimately did not fare well because in the field, they lacked the protection provided by that metabolite. Fast forward to 2018. A researcher at Texas A&M, Dr. Rathor, published research identifying the genetic mutations that result in low gossipal levels in Hopi cotton. Dr. Rathor went on to use molecular biology to silence the gossipal genes in the seeds of the cotton plant while maintaining gossipal production in other parts of the plant. By silencing the gossipal in the seeds, but allowing it to be expressed in all the other parts of the plants, the cotton plants are protected from pests, but the seeds are then edible and the seeds have a really high level of protein. So this effectively could be a source of plant-based protein. Just like the other techniques we discussed for sourcing plant-based protein, genetic modification has its own set of characteristics that should be considered when seeking regulatory approval. Of course, the basis of regulatory approval is largely safety, and this goes for genetically modified plants as well, whether it's selective breeding or genetic engineering. Plant-based protein that's sourced from selective breeding may be consumed in the raw plant or extracted as protein. If the raw plant is already grass, then it is likely the strain producing higher levels of protein is also grass. However, if the plant is further processed to extract the protein, then consideration should be given to residual solvent or concentration of other phytochemicals that at larger doses cause tox toxicity. This is why, if you have recently browsed the FDA's grass notice inventory, you will see a number of different grass notifications for pea protein. Each grass describes a different manufacturing process and has a narrative of safety that addresses any potential safety concerns that may be introduced during the different manufacturing processes. Direct genetic engineering of plants also introduces additional regulatory hurdles. Crops produced through genetic engineering are the only ones formally reviewed by U.S. regulatory agencies. When new traits are genetically engineered into a crop, the new plants are evaluated to ensure they do not have characteristics of weeds. Where biotech crops are grown in pro proximity to related plants, the potential for the two plants to exchange traits via pollen must also be evaluated before the plant is released. Crop plants of all kinds can exchange traits with their close wild relatives, which may be weeds or wild wildflowers, when they're in proximity. In the case of biotech-derived crops, the EPA and USDA perform risk assessments to evaluate this possibility and minimize potential harmful consequences. Regardless of the technology that you are using to create a food ingredient or plant-based protein food ingredient, the basis for regulatory compliance is safety of the product. The safety of the product should be evaluated for the intended use. You will need to think about your target consumer and what kinds of foods that your ingredient will be added to, or what kinds of foods you expect your ingredient will replace. If you are planning on making a health claim or a structure function claim on your final product when you're marketing, there are additional regulatory considerations that we haven't discussed in this webinar. Lastly, I want to touch on some common pitfalls that I see companies fall into. One of the most common issues that I see is that a company develops a prototype and they establish the safety of the ingredient with toxicological testing using these prototype batches. Then when the company tries to scale up, they find that the prototype manufacturing process isn't commercially viable. They often change the manufacturing process, which in turn can alter the specifications of the product from the prototype. Once your specifications are altered, any toxicological testing that you have done no longer fully supports the safety of your final product. It's critical that you establish reproducible specifications early in your development process so you can avoid this rework later.
This concludes our webinar. I hope that you found this information helpful. And if we can assist you in any way, please feel free to reach out at info at burdockgroup.com.